Colossians 5 and one hand and, feet, and Colossians chapter number 3. I just want you to look at one verse in each. Last week we, we finished our study about being filled with the Spirit by comparing Ephesians 5.18 and Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. And you should have those two verses written down next to each other in, in the margin of your, of your Bible. <laughs> Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I tried to show you when we finished last week that in Ephesians chapter 3, when he, uh, Ephesians 5, when he says, be filled with the Spirit, it produces a certain set of results. It produces personal results of the spe uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's uh, giving thanks always, submitting yourselves. It produces exactly the same results in, in Colossians, but, it, but there, instead of being filled with the Spirit, he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, you know in math, if, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That's just sort of a common thing you know that. And when things have the same results, the, being filled with the Spirit has exactly the same results as, being, as having the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And the exact same results come from those two things because those two things are synonym, they're synonymous. If you want to understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit, Colossians 3.16 tells you it means to have the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's important to remember that the Holy Spirit works through the instrumentality of His Word. When the Holy Spirit works in the Bible, it's always, He always works through His Word. He doesn't work in a cloud out there. He's not working in some, some mysterious ways as wonders to perform. God the Holy Ghost works through His Word. Hold your hand here and come with me to Genesis chapter 1. I use this illustration a lot because it's just so fundamental to understand and yet so foreign to most people's thinking. Genesis chapter 1. The first time in your Bible you read about the Holy Spirit working is in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. Genesis 1, verse number 2. He says in verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here's the first time in the Bible that God the Holy Spirit is going to work and move on His creation. And what does He do? How does He do it? The next verse, And God said, Let there be light. So when the Holy Spirit wants to move in His creation, what does He do? God speaks. You follow that? God the Holy Spirit, right in the very beginning, all through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit works through the instrumentality of His words. There's an objective reality of the Spirit of God working. When He says, be filled with the Spirit, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, that is an objective reality. That's not an experiential feeling. It's not an experience. It's not an assumption. It's not a wish. It has to do with having the Word of God dwell in you. That is, to, to settle down and run your life, to control your mind, control your thinking processes. And by faith, you simply take a stand on the truth of what God says in His Word on the pages of His book, and you have what Paul calls the obedience of faith. You believe it, and then you obey what it says because you believed it. <laughs> and that's how God the Holy Spirit works in your life. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 4, and it's... it's it's the objective side of this that I want you to get a hold of. Being filled with the Spirit is not just talking about some experience. It's not talking about some emotion. It's not talking about a wish. It's not talking about a feeling. It's not talking about an assumption. You test all those by the objective standard of the written Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Uh, David talked about this yesterday in the men's meeting. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and, and, and of joints and marrow, and is, watch, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah says, the heart, Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and who can know it? The verse answers, it says, I, the Lord, try the reins of the heart. 
your heart is so deceitful that it will trick you, deceive you into thinking you're, you're living in the new man when you're really living in your old man. It will deceive you into thinking that you're being filled with the Spirit when you're really just being filled with yourself. The only way you have of objectively knowing that you're walking in the new man, walking in the Spirit, and not walking in your old man, you know the verse, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Your flesh is so deceitful. He's so, it's so good at conning you. And you're so good at letting it. I'm so good at letting it. Thank you. <laughs> I should have heard a bunch of guys say amen on that one, not just the ladies. <laughs> but you, got, you have to remember that. And you need an objective standard outside of yourself. Because you, if you're trusting yourself, dude, you're in trouble. There's all this stuff today about we need to have a purpose-driven life, you know, and all that stuff. Well, who's going to decide that? You do. Can I tell you it's better to have a meaningful life? That's what you really need to have. Well, the standard of that is the Word of God. The greatest example, I'm trying to think about how to talk with you about this. The greatest example of a, of, of a spirit-controlled life. If you wanted to see a life filled with the Spirit, people call it, are you a Spirit-filled church? Well, yeah, sure we are. <laughs> we think we are filled with something. What does it look like? How would you put it on display? I've told people for years, People tell me, say, well, you, you know, what you're doing in the ministry is not right. You ought to do it this way, not that way. And I, I've told people for years, you know, if you think it ought to be done that way, go do it. And then let's see what it looks like. And if it looks better than what doing over here, we'll, we'll do that. But I'm doing this, and here the verse is why. You're going to do that, and you got a verse, you don't have a verse. Put it on display. What does it look like? What's the fruits of it? Well, what does a spirit-filled life look like? Where would you point? Well, the, 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 great exa the greatest example of a, is, is, is not Pentecostalism. It's not the signs and wonders crowd. If you want to see what that is, just turn your TV on to go find the Impact Network or the Word Network or TBN, that kind of stuff, and you'll see it all over. I watch that stuff and say, how in the world do they get the money to do that? I I mean, I know how much forgotten truths cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month to do that. And I think, man, uh, anyway, that's not the example. In the Bible, the greatest example of a spirit-controlled life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back with me at John chapter 3. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the Lord Jesus Christ lived his life under the control of God the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, verse number 34. John 3, 34, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Jesus Christ, come with me in Luke chapter 4, had the Spirit of God in his life working without any measure, without any limitation. It was complete control. He was completely filled with the Spirit. Luke chapter number 4, Jesus is talking. Verse number 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where, where it is written, now this is, going to, this is a passage in Isaiah 61, and it's a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and so forth. I just want you to see, the Spirit of the Lord is on him. God the Father anointed him with God the Holy Spirit, and he anointed him with him without any measure. So if you want to see someone who is completely filled, completely under the control of the Spirit of God, it would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come with me to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. That's why 
The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 2, verse number 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I want you to have the same mindset that the Lord Jesus Christ had, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became, you see that next word, obedient unto death. There's the obedience of faith that led him all the way to the cross. And Paul says, I want you to have the mindset that Christ had toward the Word of God that led him to the obedience of faith that led him all the way to Calvary. Now when he says, I would let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, he's not talking about the Jewish program Christ was under. He's talking about having the mindset that Christ had toward the program of God that he lived under. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse number 2. Here's the way the book of Hebrews says this. Looking unto Jesus, I'll well, start in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by, by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's all the people in chapter 11, and uh, let us lay aside every weight and, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, lay aside the old covenant, Lay aside the sin, personal sins that beset you, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. So these people are told, you need to run the race. Lay aside all the, all the baggage. Run the race by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now here's how he did it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. So how did Jesus Christ, how was he obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? He was looking, who for the joy that was set before him, there was something that he knew was going to be accomplished by that cross work. There's something going to happen out there because of this. And for the joy that was set before him, he looked at this and said, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. He had a mindset that was bigger than the moment. That mindset came to him from his father, from the will of God. He understood what he was doing. Look back at chapter 10, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 5. Wherefore, when he, that's Christ, cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast no pleasure. Lo, I'm sorry, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of a book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Where did he find God's will? In the volume of the book. By the way, that's a quote from Psalm chapter 40. So when Christ came into the world, he's doing what? He's quoting Psalm 40 and said, that's what I'm doing. The obedience of faith that Christ had was obedience to the will of his Father that he found in the word of his Father. John chapter 10, Jesus said, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down, I take it up again. John 10, 18. This commandment have I received from my Father. So when he went to the cross, what was he doing? It was the obedience to God's word that he's executing. That's why it says the obedience unto death. He was obeying the will of his Father. I don't know if you ever thought about if Jesus Christ was made sin for us at Calvary, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How could he be made sin and not be a sinner? You ever thought about that? Well, I have. That used to bother me. How could he be made sin and not be a sinner? Because he was made sin in obedience to the Father's will. He wasn't made sin because he was in rebellion against the Father. That's how you're made a sinner. Every time you sin, it's not because you're trying to obey God. You're obeying your old sin nature. You're, you're, you're having it your way. 
You think you're smarter than God, your way's better than him. You don't want to retain God your knowledge. You're going to give yourself over to your own, what, your own will. That's where sin comes from. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into our own way. With the Lord Jesus Christ was made sin in obedience to the... You follow that? That's, that's important to get that. I come to do thy will. It was the obedience of faith. So the Lord Jesus Christ lived, had that mindset of obeying what God's word said, trusting what God's word said. That's why in John 12, he, t he tells his disciples, the, word, the things, the commandments I give you, they're not mine. They're the things the Father gave me to tell you. I'm completely trusting the Father. Jesus Christ lived under the control of God's word. Lived in obedience to it. It's interesting to study through, through the gospel accounts and see how the Lord Jesus Christ used the scripture. Uh, it, it seems to me that basically, and I'm, we're not, I'm not teaching this this morning, but this is something to think about. He, you, you know, he quotes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He quotes the book of Psalms. He quotes the book of Proverbs. He quotes the book of Isaiah. He quotes the book of Jeremiah. He quotes the book of Daniel. He quotes the book of Hosea. He quotes uh, Zechariah. He, qu he, he quotes scripture all over the place. I mean, he's quote, I'm talking about the, the verses talking about that, the, these verses. He, he is depending on He's using them. And he uses them basically in three ways. One is to defend his viewpoint. Matthew 19. God's asking him about marriage and about divorce. And what does he do? He quotes Genesis 2 and says from the beginning, well, that way, here's what, here's what the book says. So he, he'll defend himself with that. So people come and ask him a bunch of questions, and he says, you, you do err, not knowing the Scripture nor the power of God. And by the way, here's what the book says. <laughs> so he'll use the Scripture to defend his views. He'll use the Scripture to encourage his disciples' faith. He'll say, here's what the Bible says, here's what the Scripture says, I need you to believe that. But what I want you to see this morning is he uses the Scripture also to express his own faith, to tell you how he, to express his own feelings, to tell you, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the place where, what I want you to see this morning, is there's one place where in one event Christ does that in such a marvelous way. When he hung on the cross of Calvary, now, by the way, you remember when he started with his ministry with the temptation and Satan would say this, and Christ would say, it's written. Then he'd say, it's written again. See, so he builds his ministry from the very beginning on what's written in the book. But at the end of his life, hanging on the cross, he speaks seven times. Each one of those seven sayings is a direct fulfillment of Scripture. And they demonstrate the place that the Word of God played in the life and the thinking and the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. For even in his darkest hour, he's in his mind, what he's thinking is, is Scripture. What his mind is, he's thinking the thoughts that God gives him about that hour. Now, in the bookstore, there's a series of teaching on the seven saints. I'm not going to repeat all that this morning. But they're fascinating. The seven sayings of Christ on the cross, three of them are found only in Luke. Three of them are found only in John. One of them is found only in Matthew and Mark. The first three that he says have a dispensational viewpoint to them. The middle one has a doctrinal issue and the last three have a sort of a devotional kind of application of all that. So when you study them, it's fascinating. But the, the thing I want you to see is that the, he, the Lord Jesus Christ kept his mind all through that, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He kept his mind on what the Word of God said. And he's literally ticking the verses off thinking through the events in light of what God's Word said about what's happening. And when you see that, you go, wow, there's a life. That's what it means. There's an illustration of being filled with the Spirit, of having the Word of God dwell in you richly. So if you want to know how to go home this afternoon and live with your life, there's the illustration. 
Come back with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 23. I'm going to go through this with you and just show you how they work out. Luke 23. The first, the first thing that he says from the cross is in Luke 23. And get Luke 23 and one hand on Isaiah chapter 52, because uh, 53 rather, we're going to need, need to look at that passage a couple of times. Isaiah chapter 53. I'll just save a couple of minutes. Luke chapter 23 and Isaiah 53. Luke 23 verse 33. Luke 23, 33. When they had come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. By the way, that's the only place in your Bible that the word Calvary occurs. If you don't have a King James Bible, your Bible doesn't have that word in it there. That's a fascinating thing. Just like the world has been unplugged from understanding anything about God's Word. The body of Christ has been unplugged from its history, of Prot the Protestant history that you get through your King James Bible. When you lay that book aside, the King James Bible said, you unplug yourself from the landmarks that have marked the way through the, through, through, through the centuries. That word Calvary, people say, well, it, it, listen, that word, that's the only place it is in your Bible. It's there because that's exactly what it, what, what it ought to be. Now, so they take him, they crucify him at Calvary. You know that. You think, think of the songs and the, the poetry and all that. What that one term signifies in your mind. There he is. Now verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now that's a full, that, what he's doing there, look back at Isaiah 53. Verse number 12. Now you know Isaiah 53 is about the, is about the cross work of Christ. It's about the Messiah. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and what? Made intercession for the transgressors. You know what Jesus is doing? He's doing exactly that. He's making intercession for the transgressors. Hold, hang, set something in Isaiah 53, will you? Because we're going to keep going back there. Now look back at Luke 23. Watch how he does this. When it says he makes intercession for the transgressors, this is not an incidental thing. When he says, Father, forgive them, the verse start, the first, see the first word in that verse, then. It's when he when they had done their worst by hanging him on the tree. They hung him up on that tree. They didn't just want him, they didn't want to stone him. They didn't want him just to die. They want him hung on that tree. That's why they wanted Rome to kill him, because that's how Rome killed him. But what does the Bible say about someone that hangs on the tree? Galatians 3.13, Deuteronomy 21, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. They didn't want to just kill him. They wanted to curse him. They wanted him to be separated from God, cut off. And it's at that desperate moment that he says, Father, forgive them. Now you think about that. Father, forgive them. You go back to Matthew chapter number 9. And there's a guy there and Jesus says, no man can forgive God his sin but God only. So Christ said to him, Thy sins are forgiven. Up until this point, the Lord Jesus Christ had forgiven people's sins personally. But now on the cross, he's not in that position of authority. Now he's, he's in the position of, of servant. And he's looking to the Father and he intercedes for that wayward nation. 
It's motivated by what? By the Father's will. By the love and grace of God. Motivated by, hey, make intercession for transgressors. Previously, he'd just forgiven them. Now he's asking the Father to. Come with me to Luke chapter 23 and drop down to verse number 40. Or verse 39. It says that the male factor is on one side or the other. Verse 39, one of the male factors which, was, which were hanged, hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? Those two male factors represented the two factions in Israel. One rejected him. The other recognized him. We indeed just, uh, justly, verse 41, for we received the, the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He recognized who Christ was. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. There's, what, there's the faith Christ had been looking for in Israel. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, I never knew you bunch of lousy rascals. No. He said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know what he wasn't afraid to do? If you go back to Isaiah chapter... 52, verse 12 again. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall, be, shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was what? Numbered with the transgressors. You see that? He was numbered with. You know what he did when he came, he came to John the Baptist to be baptized? John the Baptist says, boy, I'm not worthy to unlatch your shoes. I should be. He said, no, no. Suffer it. Allow me to allow this to be to fulfill all righteousness. He started his ministry. He ended his ministry choosing to be numbered with his people. You come with me to John chapter 19. Here's the next. He didn't do that, folks. He, did, he, he didn't do that out of, out of anything. He, I, I just pulled that out of the air. He did that. Because he was obeying God's word. Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 19. The next thing he says from the cross, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Three Marys were there, three M's. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her under his own home. Now that's the one saying from the cross that's really kind of weird. I remember when I first moved to Chicago, the first Easter season that we were here, uh, Don Ellison was at Norwood Bible Church at the time, and they had a Good Friday service. Now I'll be honest with you, I had never participated in a Good Friday service in my life before that or since then. Because, you know, that's a Catholic tradition that I just had never participated in. But because, it, you know, to be friendly and so forth, we, I went. And he asked me, he said, we're going to speak on the seven sayings of the cross. And I'll give you the, you pick the one you want. And I thought, well, there's going to be seven of us and all the other guys are going to, you know. I said, I'll take the one nobody wants, that one. 
Because when you read about the seven, this is the one everybody just goes, huh? And it doesn't mean, but when you really study it and look at it, it's really fascinating. First of all, if you look back at Isaiah 52 and verse 13, this is the, the 13, 14, and 15 introduced the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Verse 13, Behold, my servant, that's the Messiah, shall deal how? Prudently. You know how the Messiah, when he comes, is going to deal? He's going to be prudent. He's going to be wise. He's going to be thoughtful in, in, in his dealings, in his thinking. He's going to be able to think ahead about things. Come with me to Proverbs chapter 23. You know what the, uh, what the Bible says about mamas and dads? What are you supposed to do with your mother and your father? Honor thy mother and thy father. Proverbs 23, verse 22. Hearken unto thy father. Proverbs 23, 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did? He's hanging on that cross, and there his mother and the other women are standing there, and he's going to deal wisely. He's going to think ahead. He's going to plan for the little details in her life. Mary was a woman of great strength. If you read through the Bible study about Mary, she was a woman of real strength. She was not some wallflower, and she was not some pushover. She was a woman of tremendous capacity. And you see that all through her life. Yet here, in his death, her oldest son, her firstborn son didn't leave his mother without caring for her. And you look at that and you see that care all the way to the end for mom. But there's something more than just that. There's a, there's, a, there's a role that Mary plays in the life of Christ. You see how he says to her, it's kind of harsh. Woman, behold, I said... All my married life, my wife sitting back there, she, I'll say, wife, and then when I first, I, Pisa, don't you know her name? Yeah, I know her name. Her name is Cynthia, but for me, she's wife, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I, of course, sometimes I call her chick and that kind of stuff, but that's, but uh, on my computer, you, you know, she's, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on my computer, you know, the contacts, it's wife. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of synthes in the world, but there's only one wife. When he called her woman, there was something special about that term. But it's kind of harsh and sounding. Just, we got, we got a minute. Look back at Luke chapter 2. Listen, let me tell you, if you want something that's fascinating, go get that study uh, on the seven saints, listening to Jesus die. Each one of these things is a whole message. And to me, this is one of the ones that's really kind of, uh, the first three are dispensational. One, here's the nation, there's the apostate group in the nation, and I, I, I'm praying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what to do. He appeals to the Father not to pour his wrath out on apostate Israel. Then he says, Here, here's the little flock that's come out, they believe me, we're going to go to the kingdom. Now he says, woman, behold thy son, son, behold your mother. He's transferring... Mary into the care of John, and John into the care of Mary, to, to take care of Mary. But there's something else, because every time Jesus in the book of John talks to his mother and calls her, he says, woman, chapter 2 at the wedding, woman, what have I to do with it? That's a special description of Mary and the role that she, she plays in the life of Christ. Not only is she the mother of the Messiah, she's a picture of the nation that brings forth the Messiah. Luke chapter 2. Verse 33, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. They're in, the, they're in Jerusalem. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now watch the parenthesis. Yea, a sword shall pierce thine own soul also, that, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That little parenthesis is put in there to describe the role that Mary is going to play as a picture of the nation Israel. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to go through it, but if you write down by that verse, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 6, 
you'll see where, 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 where Israel is described as a woman forsaken and grieved. And that's who Mary represents. She represents her nation. Forsaken and grieved, they've crucified their Messiah. But who's John? He's one of the twelve. The, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's one of the twelve. Isn't that a wonderful way to be described? to describe yourself. The guy that wrote the book of John, when he describes himself, he says, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. woo <laughs> He got it. He understood who he was. You know who he represents? Fear not, little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And what you see there in picture form is the Lord Jesus Christ taking that nation and committing them into the hands of that little flock. And that little flock being responsible to take care of that nation. So there's more going on there in the, the picture. My point to you is it's all what the scriptures. He's dealing prudently with what's going. He's doing exactly what the scripture says. Come with me to Matthew. Now that's the first three. And those have dispensational kind of things. But they're, they're, I hope you can see they're, they're fulfilling what the Scripture says is going to happen. In Matthew chapter 27, and this one is in Matthew and Mark. Just look at Matthew 27 because, as is always, time is fleeting by. Matthew chapter 27 Verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, if you come back to Psalm chapter 22, you'll see that in reality he's quoting the book of Psalms. And what that verse tells you is what's in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of that hour of darkness, when the power of darkness, that spiritual, not just Luke 22 says that the, the sun was darkened and then the power of darkness came. There's not just physical darkness, there's spiritual darkness. The, the power of darkness of the satanic forces have come there to claim the sin bearer. And what's happening is in his mind, he's thinking what? Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you read on down through that psalm, down to about verse number 21, you'll read details about the cross work of Christ. You look at verse 18, they parted my garments. Verse 15, my strength is dried up. Verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Verse 12, the bulls have compassed me about strong bulls of Bashan. Verse 11, but not, be not far from me for trouble is near. There is none to help. All describing, look at verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 3. We'll just I'm start in verse 2. Oh my God, here's what he's crying. In the daytime, I cry unto in the daytime. And thou hearest not. And in the night season, it's dark, and I'm, not, and I'm not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that hast... There's the problem. You're listening to the Lord Jesus Christ as he became your sin bearer. He literally has made sin for you. And the Bible says that God cannot look on sin. He's holy. He can't... Literally right there, Jesus Christ is being made the propitiation, the fully satisfying sacrifice for your sin. As the eternal Son of God, he is, in, he is experiencing your second death. You see it in verse 5, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. When he says, I am a worm. That's just not talking, I'm just some old wretched guy. That term worm is a term of art in your Bible. Mark chapter number 9, Jesus talks about people being cast into hell where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. 
That's a quote out of Isaiah 66, then, last couple of verses, where he talks about some people in the lake of fire, and he says, their worm dies not. That's a description of the soul of a person enduring the second death. Jesus Christ at the Cal on Calvary in that middle cry is crying out and he is suffering at that moment all that your sin produced and everything that you deserve because of your sin. And Christ is dying for your sin. And he pays, he takes the burden, he takes the weight, he takes the result of all of your sin, the wages of your sin, what your sin earns, and he takes it upon himself, and he pays that. He experiences that. Say it any way you want to say it. And he became your sin bearer. And in that, those moments of darkness when he cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is an eternal transaction going on in the annals of the Godhead where Jesus Christ literally suffers your second death. The transformation in his soul, which is your second death. And he didn't do that because he deserved it. He did it in obedience. A body that has prepared for me. You don't want sacrifices and offering. You need a real one. And I've come to give myself a ransom for many. Now hold on to the book of Psalms and come back to John chapter 19. Because when that experience is over with, the cross isn't over with. There are three more sayings. John 19. Having endured that experience, having gone to the depths of where sin takes you, should take you. John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, The sin payment's made. Now watch. That the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. <laughs> I love that. There he is coming out of all that experience and all the depth and the pathos and the emotion and the agony and all the rest. That the scripture, it doesn't say scripture, it says script, one scripture. It's as though he's hanging on that cross and he's thinking, finish that scripture, finish that verse, finish that verse. There's one verse over the in Psalm 69, verse 21, that hadn't been fulfilled yet. So he says, I thirst. Why? So that now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it to the hyssop to his mouth. Why? When Jesus therefore... They put it to his mouth because that's what Psalm 69 verse 21 says what he's going to say. And he had to say, I thirst to get that verse to be fulfilled. Look back at Psalm 69 real quick. Psalm 69 verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. So John 19, verse 29 says, they filled the vessel and gave him vinegar. Why did they do that? The only reason they did it is because he said, I thirst. And the reason he said, I thirst, is he knew that verse back there hadn't been fulfilled yet. I need to get it fulfilled. So he motivated them to do what the Scripture said they would do, that they didn't even know they were, it, about the Scripture going to tell them to do it. He knew it, so he does it. You get the idea? God's Word is being flowing through his mind so much that a little obscure verse like that, that you and I read it wouldn't understand what it is, but he did because he wrote it. Boom. That hadn't been full. He was so saturated with God's Word. You walk around and say, well, the Word of God won't work in my life. And you, could, you couldn't quote me five verses about the issue you're talking about. You understand that? You said, well, I got this issue in my life, and God's Word didn't work. I said, well, give me four or five verses you're trying to obey. Well, I don't really don't know any verses about it. Well, no wonder it's not working in your life. I mean, if you're such a dumb thump that you don't know the verse, and you think the verse isn't going to work, no, it don't, they don't just come out of it. They, they're in the book. 
You need to get in the book, get the book in you, and then you know what? The verses will work if you believe them. And his life is so, mind so controlled by it, so filled with it. One verse that needed to be fulfilled. And he's checking them off. Now, now, now read the next verse, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It's finished. All the verses are fulfilled. Everything's done. The work's accomplished. Now come with me to Psalm 22. And notice how Psalm 22 ends. Psalm 22, after the crucifixion, there's the resurrection. Verse number uh, 21, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horn of the unicorn. I will declare thy name among the brethren. Uh, verse number 25, My praise shall be in thee, uh, of thee in the great, tr great congregation. Verse 26, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. Verse uh, 28, the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor of all nations. Here he comes, second coming, sets up the kingdom. Verse number 30, the, a seed shall serve him. That's why he says to, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to be that born again seed in Israel. It shall be accomplished, uh, accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people that shall be born, that he hath what? He did it. It's done. Go over to Revelation 22, verse 6, and they say, it's done. You know what he does on the cross? He said, everything going to accomplish everything God wants done. It's done. It's finished. Woohoo! John 19, verse 30, it says, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He bowed his head. You know, if he bowed his head, you know where his head was before? He wasn't lollygagging around. I'm just so beat to death. I don't know what's going on. He was in complete control of all of his faculties. His head is erect. He knows what's going on. He's ticking off the verses. And he said, they're all done. That word's in control of his life. And he gave up the ghost. You know what he did? Look at Luke 23, the last cry. Because you don't want to miss this. Luke 23, verse 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice. Think about that. His head's erect. He can still bellow it out. You know why you talk with a loud voice? You want to project. Years ago, I was going to some people to preach. They didn't know me and I didn't know them. And the older brother, I was in my 30s, and the older brother's in his 70s, 60s, early 70s. He was explaining to him that when you preach, you need to project. Well, after I got through preaching, he says, you've got no problem with projection. <laughs> and I'd been preaching on the street for about 15 years. I knew how to project. But anyway, when you speak with a loud voice, you want everybody to hear it. He said, Father... Into thy hands I commend my spirit. If you write by that verse, Psalm 31, verse 5, you'll see that that is a direct quote. He's not just fulfilling Scripture. He's quoting the Scripture. Psalm 31, verse 5. And then he said... When he had said that, he gave up the ghost. <laughs> Literally, as an act of his own will, he dismissed his spirit. He speaks with a loud voice, not a weak voice, with an erect head, not a, uh, no, not, not, not a, not a, a swooning head. But in that voice of victory that cries, it's finished. And he cries, Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit into the Father's presence. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his life, especially at Calvary, in all of his life, but especially in the moment of that great crisis, he rests his faith in the word of his Father. who had declared the decree, this day have I begotten thee. 
I've declared the decree. I'll set my son. He knew that death couldn't hold him. Not just because of who he was, but because of the will and the word of his father. And while he gave his life, laid it down, he did it according to the will of his father. And when he took it up again, he did it according to the will of his father because all of the Godhead was working together in your redemption. And the Lord Jesus Christ was living a spirit-filled life. He was living a life under the control of God's word. And what that cross work experience, those sayings from the cross demonstrate is something about the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ in the event that he was going through. And you need to appreciate that. You need to learn from that. Paul said it this way for you and me. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You look and see how Jesus lived. In complete control, contr complete, the Word of God completely controlling Him. And that's the mindset that we should have. So just like He made that conscious choice of faith to walk in an understanding of the program of God to Him, we should, we can, bring the details of our life into the control of God's Word to us. You need to know it like he knew it. Then you need to depend on it like he depended on it. I learned many years ago, when you depend on something, it will control your life. If you depend on an angry spirit to get your way, if you depend on a little pill to get you through the day or a glass of something. What you depend on will control you. When you depend on the love and grace of God to you and Jesus Christ, that will control you. And that happens as you put your faith. The Word of God works effectually in you that believe. So when we go back to Ephesians 5 and begin to study what that spirit control life looks like in the next few verses in Ephesians 5 and the lifestyle that it produces in your family, your marriage, your family, and your world. Understand, it comes because God's Word in those areas controls your life. You've got a great Savior in every way. Everything you ever need is provided in Him. It's anything but religion. Amen. If you've never trusted him, he's worthy. If you've never trusted him to keep you out of hell and the lake of fire and to take you to heaven and give you eternal life as a present possession, give you an identity that you could never have in yourself, forgive your sins, give you a meaningful life, you need to trust him. Just rest in Him. God looks at your heart and wants to see your faith, trusting His Son to be the Savior that He died and rose again for you to be. And when you trust Him exclusively, He won't share that, he won't share that position with anything or anyone else. But when you trust Him, He'll save you. And folks, after you've trusted Him to save you, you can trust Him to live His life through you in whatever the circumstances you face are. Father, we thank You today for Your love and Your grace to us in Christ Jesus. And for the fact that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, put on display in real human terms the reality of your life living in us and through us for your glory. We pray that we might appreciate that and be filled with the Spirit. Thank you in Christ's name.